Luke, I found it in the New Testament. <laughs> and be reading from chapter 23, verses 39 through 43. Be reading this from the King James, New King James Version. Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, if you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Do not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation. And we indeed justify, for we are received the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. found that just before the Gospel of John, didn't you? <laughs> well, we've already given you a prelude of what we're going to talk about this morning. Three crosses and their meanings for us today. Their message. <clears throat> Kumba's husband, Rob, is on his way uh, back east to Illinois, is that correct? Huh? Oh, Wisconsin, that's right. Um, and uh, it'll be about a eight-hour trip, and uh, I don't know if he's there yet. No, he left this morning around 6 or 7 or something like that. So uh, I'd like to remember Rob in our prayers as he travels, and he'll be there for several days and return back. Bow with me. Father in heaven, we're just so thankful you hear our prayers. And we are prayerful, Heavenly Father, that the fire that is burning down south will be put out soon. And that lives and property and animals will be saved. We pray, dear Lord, that our hearts will overflow, overflow with generosity. And that, they, uh, that the gifts that we provide will help alleviate their suffering. And those people that have been... Uh, moved out of their homes, evacuated. Many of those people losing everything that they had. Father, help our hearts to go out to those that are still recovering in the north part of this state. Those that have lost lives and those that have lost everything. And the survivors have to put their lives back together again and and now it's happening again in, in the south of California. And we pray, dear Lord, that you would help them and help people who are qualified to minister to them and counsel them. And we pray for an overflow of generosity from our government to help these who have suffered such loss. But we know, Heavenly Father, that there are many things that cannot be replaced. The loss of lives, the loss of precious possessions such as family pictures and heirlooms and items that are so meaningful to people and even Bibles being destroyed. 
and pray, dear Lord, that our compassion and love will overflow with generosity. And now, Father, we pray for Rob and his travels, and we ask you to watch over him and return him uh, home once again. We pray, dear Lord, for us as we are here this day with grateful hearts for our health and opportunity and ability to come and to worship you and to study your word together, to commemorate the death of Jesus in the Lord's Supper and sing these beautiful hymns, to encourage and, and, and teach one another through the message of the songs. And Father, we pray for each other in our needs and especially our spiritual needs as we address these at this time. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, on that place called the Skull, Golgotha or Calvary, they placed three crosses, and upon those three crosses we find three individuals, as we have already pointed out. There we see three people, three figures hanging suspended between heaven and earth to slowly die of asphyxiation and pain. The sufferers are doomed to die with a criminal on both sides of Jesus. The Son of God was numbered with the transgressors. Not only anguish of body, but of anguish of mind unparalleled. And soldiers with callous indifference watch the tortured victims slowly die. The crowds gathered and morbidly in their own curiosity came upon the pathetic, pathetic sight. The Jewish rulers looked with a smirk of triumph upon him whose life their deadly venom of hate had targeted. A few friends and tender-hearted women gaze with sympathy and tears. No wonder that that scene should be so riveted in the minds of every Christian in the picture galleries and art galleries throughout the world. Some of the masterpieces of famous painters schooled in various schools depicting the crucifixion of the Holy One and the Just One in their own way. For us, the scene has not only is not only of artistic value, but also and far more has spiritual significance. One cross is the symbol of divine love and human salvation. The central figure of the three is the one that draws our eye. There's the cross, whatever spectator can discern, of being undoubtedly innocent holy, benevolent, and good, is suffering unjustly. Yet he endures with all patience and meekness with no complaint, but with sincere words of forgiveness for his foes. We conceive Jesus saying, All ye that pass by, behold and see, was there ever sorrow like unto my sorrow? Lamentations chapter 1. What did Christ's enemies see in the cross? In 1 Corinthians 1 and 18, they saw foolishness, the fruit of their malice, the success of their schemes. Constantly throughout his three and a half years, they plotted his death. They attempted his uh, stoning, but his hour had not come. But the night of the Passover, Jesus said, his hour had come. He prayed that this cup of suffering would be removed, but there was no other way. And Jesus accepted the will of the Father. And so the fulfillment of these 
enemies of the cross, the fulfillment of their hopes, expressed indeed the callousness and the corruption of their own hearts. And a more practical and interesting question for us is, what do we behold in the cross of Christ? What do we see there? To all the friends of the one on the cross, he is still Lord. He is the revelation of the power and the wisdom of God, 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 24. Christ is truly the power and the wisdom of God. And the voice that reaches us from Calvary is the voice that speaks of forgiveness and love and acceptance. Forgive them for they know not what they do in Luke 23, 24. Here Christians recognize the provision of full and everlasting salvation. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth on him should never perish but have everlasting life. In verse 17, for, for God did not send him to condemn the world but that the world might be saved through him. Here are those that look with compassion and pity upon Jesus. Those who know who he is. They come under the influence of the highest motive which appeals to the spiritual nature and calls forth an affectionate and grateful devotion. Now truly, no love, no greater love hath any man than to lay down his life for his friends. John 12, 32. The poet wrote, from the cross uplifted high, where the Savior designs to die. What melodious sounds I hear bursting on my ravished ear. Love's redeeming work is done. Come and welcome, sinner, come. Then there is a second cross. It's the the symbol of impenitence and rejection of divine mercy. In the blaspheming of this robber, who hung by the side of the Lord Jesus. We have an awful example of human sin and crime and an awful witness of human justice and penalty for such. And an awful illustration of the hardness of a person's heart in spite of the fact that they are dying and their last breaths are filled with venomous, Resentment and hatred. Here his disposition is only to seek his own own deliverance, but not the deliverance from sin. He is thinking when he says, save us if you are the Messiah. He is not thinking of the just deserts of his sin, of the retribution that he deserved. The other man on the other cross said, We're getting what we deserve, but not this innocent man. And so a degraded life is followed by a hopeless death. Several terrible lessons are taught by this felon's character and faith. Number one, it is impossible, how impossible it is, for those to be saved who reject the means of salvation. Luke 10, 16, he rejects me, rejects the one who sent me, says Jesus. How possible it is to be close to Jesus Christ in body, in communion, in communication, in privilege, and yet because destitute of faith and love to be without any of the benefits of that proximity. And there are even today people that are in that situation. But let's rewind and go to this man who happened to have the privilege and benefit of being called to be one of the 12 apostles, the 12 disciples, Judas Iscariot. This man had the privilege of being next to Jesus for three years. He had the privilege of also becoming the treasurer of the three, of the, of the group. And here we find this man privileged to hear all the teachings of Jesus and to witness all the miraculous works of mercy performed by Jesus. And yet not any of that helped him in the least spiritually. 
We can attend church every Sunday. We can take Lord's suppers every week. We can sing hymns in every service and have the blessed, blessed privileges of supporting the Lord's work. And yet we can be no closer to the Lord than Judas was for those three and a half years. That is a scary situation. And that is a possibility because we have precedent for that fact. And how foolish it is to rely upon a late repentance seeing that sinners are found to persevere in sin and unbelief even in the immediate prospect of death. In 79 AD in Italy, Vesuvius, Mount Vesuvius erupted and destroyed the city of Pompeii, buried it with 12 feet of ashes. And in modern times, that city was unearthed, and we discovered that that city, by all the ashes, preserved that city almost intact. Sure, all the bodies were destroyed by the heat, but the bones of the, of the skeleton remains of human beings were still there. And one stands out as an illustration of what I'm talking about. There is one skeleton face down with his arm stretched out, his finger reaching as far as he could for coins, for his money. His last thought was for money, for his wealth being lost. Can you picture that? Can you picture the last thought of a dying person was of material possessions and not of his Lord? The second cross is certainly a symbol of impenitence and rejection of divine mercy. Now the third cross is the symbol of penitence and pardon. The story has been told many times about that thief on the cross who defended Jesus and rebuked the other thief for railing upon Jesus. This man showed that he accepted his plight, that he was suffering for his own sins, and that he recognized who this Jesus was. Now, obviously, all three of these were Jewish. And the words that came out of this man showed that he was a Jew. Because he knew something of the kingdom that was promised to come. And said to Jesus, acknowledging that he believed that although he too was dying, this man in the center cross, was still the Messiah in spite of the fact that he was dying because he truly believed and said, remember me when you come into your kingdom, showing that this man believed in a resurrection and that he believed that this Jesus was the Messiah and he believed that there was to be a kingdom that would come and that he wanted to be a part of that. You see the process of seeking God even in more mortal extremity is evident here. In Matthew 26 through 12, even those that come into the kingdom in the 11th hour will be blessed richly. And so conscience works and convic conviction of sins follows. It creates a new disposition of the soul. Lord, what do you want me to do? Lord, remember me. This prompts the fearless rebuke of his neighbor's sin. His faith in the circumstances is truly amazing and is exercised. True, simple, fervent prayer is offered. Lord, 
remember me. And so the manifestation of compassion and mercy, the dying Lord imparts to the dying penitent an assurance of favor. Today, you will be with me in paradise. Butchers this and says, today I say to you, you'll be in paradise with me maybe thousands of years later. Well, evidently, when you're dying, you're not going to use superfluous words. And everywhere this word today occurs in the gospel means that it's being said that that event is taking place that today, that moment. And so Jesus is not saying, I'm saying today that someday, no. He's saying today, when we die, you will be in paradise. The last chapter, 2 Corinthians, that's heaven. That's the same place that the Apostle Peter went uh, when he had a vision of heaven. Paradise and heaven is used synonymously in that chapter. Furthermore, in Philippians chapter 1, 22 and 23, the Apostle Paul says, I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Where did Christ go? He ascended into heaven. And he's seated at the right hand of God in heaven. And that is where the tree of life is, the paradise in the tree of life, according to the book of Revelation chapter 2. And therefore, when Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise, he's talking about his spirit being in heaven. Free pardon is promised and announced. It brings bright hope to the dying and immortal happiness is secured because of the blessing of Jesus. The lessons of precious encouragement are impressed upon the spectators of this third cross. We find that the soldiers, when Jesus died, said, truly this was the Son of God. Truly the impact that was made upon John who was there. And you read his gospel and you can see an eyewitness describing what he saw there. And so what we learn here is that it's possible for the vilest sinner to repent. 1 Timothy 1, 12 through 16, Paul said he blasphemed the Lord. And he tried to force Christians to blaspheme. And he said, I am the chiefest of sinners but I received mercy. And he says, I received it so that I might be an example to all that might believe. Basically, he's saying, I can walk up to a sinner and say, if God saved me, he can save you. If God can save this thief on the cross, he can save me. It is certain that a sincere penitent will be regarded with favor. Even at the 11th hour, salvation is not to be despaired of. We should never say it's too late until the dying breath is exhaled. There is a prospect before those who are accepted and pardoned of immediate joy and divine fellowship after this life is over. So what we see here is three crosses. One is a cross that is an example of those who, through hardness of heart, will not allow trouble, difficulty, pain, suffering, or even death to change their heart and accept the conditions of salvation. They can go into eternity not even thinking a moment about what awaits them in judgment. And nothing, not even suffering, can bring them to their knees in humble contrition in serving God. And then there are those like the thief, the penitent thief, who may live a life of sin and rebellion, but ultimately will have 
an experience, an event in their life that might cause them pause to think about where they are going to spend eternity and think about what they have to lose if they don't turn to the Lord and accept the conditions of God and do what they can under the circumstances they are in to obey God. Somebody says, well, the thief was saved and he wasn't baptized. That doesn't mean that baptism isn't essential for you and me. After all, I don't see any of us hanging on the cross. So it's not our question. It's not our issue. Jesus had the power to forgive this man while he was dying on the cross. In those situations where people cannot get to baptism, the Lord can forgive them because the intent of their heart is, I would if I could. Let's back up and ask the question. If Jesus let the thief on the cross down who was penitent, and he knew that baptism was necessary for all Jews in the preaching of John the Baptist and Jesus and the disciples... And Mark chapter 1 says that John preached a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Do you think that this man would refuse baptism then? Of course not. And so it's judged based upon what we're capable of doing and not what we can't do. And so that's why I always say, how is this relevant to you and me? When we have no hindrance, such as being in a cave that, that uh, closed up through an earthquake or a landslide or something like that and trapped, and we can't get to water to be baptized, or, or if we are uh, unable to be moved uh, and baptized, um, these are contingencies that the Lord takes into consideration. He's a God of mercy and a God of love. And so it comes down to, can anyone be saved who rejects the commandments of God? That's the question to be asked. And the answer is no. In 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 12, although it's talking about giving, it's a principle that applies always. For if the readiness is present, it is acceptable according to what a man has, ability, not according to what he does not have, not having that ability. That principle applies in the plan of salvation. And so the thief on the cross does not excuse us of our duty to obey the commands given to us, which includes baptism, the Lord's Supper, assembling for worship, financial support of the work of the church, good deeds, and a clean moral life. And so in James 4.17 is very loud and clear. It says, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. I hope today you'll be thinking about the three crosses and the three individuals that hang there and the lessons that we learn. We're going to sing this encouragement song, and if you need to respond and obey heaven's commands, please do that as together we stand and as we sing.